Hi, and welcome to today's installment of The Focus. I'm Aldu, and this is Horia. Welcome. And it's a great pleasure for us to welcome Janet Gregory onto the podcast today. Hello, all. <laughs> I'm now, glad to be here. We're looking forward to chatting with you today, Janet. Now, Janet, we've known each other for a few years. Do um, mm-hmm. you want to take a guess at how long um, we've, we've known one another? I think I'd have to go back and check my first uh, trip to South Africa. <laughs> Isn't that, I think that's when I first met you. Yes, yes. Yeah, and, and so that's quite a few years ago. Yeah, it's uh, probably close to between 10 and 12 years ago. That's, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Long time. And um, the reason why we asked Janet on today's podcast uh, podcast is that Janet was one of my first mentors in in the agile space. Uh, I came from a really strong testing background and Janet was actually the person that helped me to move out of the traditional waterfall thinking into the agile thinking and a lot of the stuff that she's actually helped me uh, to understand has been captured in a few testing books so, and I've had the privilege of being asked to collaborate on two of those testing books that Janet and Lisa Crispin authored. But I'm not going to go into that. Um, the reason why Janet is, is on with us today is that she's got lots and lots of experience in um, dealing with all things uh, agility and testing. And we're going to explore how she's seen how she's experienced and seen um, oversight and oversight um, behaviors uh, in the real world out there. But I'm not going to to tell about Janet's experience. We're going to give her some time to actually share her river, river of life with us. Janet. River of life. What a great um, phrase. I, I, you know, I've never heard that before, actually. River of life. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a funny thing because I never know where to start when somebody says, your river of life, like, do I start with my child? No, I don't want that. But really, my, I started, I went back to work, or I went back to work, I went back to university late in life. So my start to this part of the story is later than everybody else's that I know. And I went back to university to, and I took programming. Although when I took programming, I knew I didn't want to be a programmer forever. Um, it, it just, it wasn't something that excited me. Uh, but I did program for about six years after I got out of university until one of my uh, bosses said, Janet, how would you like to be our QA manager? And so that was my, and it, and the reason was because I was the only tester or the only programmer who was complaining about the lack of quality and processes <laughs> and anything else. So I became QA manager, got my certification in, in quality management, learned everything I could about testing. And this was very much in a, I'm not going to say waterfall because I think it was much more chaotic than that even, but what it taught me was a whole lot of things that I was supposed to have done. And when I left that very chaotic world, um, I moved into Agile and became a tester on Agile team. And I really, it, it changed how I looked at software development. It changed how I thought about uh, what quality management meant, what all kinds of other things. And so over the years as I've been Uh, working on teams or consulting with teams, Uh, had a great deal of experience uh, working with small teams who lead, say, less governance to some of those larger organizations that require much more or have regulatory kinds of needs. So I've had this really broad range, um, but I think having that uh, quality management background where I studied everything I possibly could really helped along the way. So short and sweet. And here I am. Well, you've, you've neglected to, to say that you're actually an author of three books, you and Lisa 
you co you you wrote three books on agile testing. In in yeah. other words, you wrote the book books <laughs> on agile testing. Yeah, well, that's just kind of along the way because as I was learning and learning the hard way, um, once I met Lisa and we decided to write a book because there were so many struggles that we had to work through. Because at the very beginning, um, and this was back in about 2000, when we started being those testers on the Agile teams, really didn't know what that meant mm. at all. And so we worked real hard to figure out what it meant. And then we decided we wanted to share it. And I think that sharing information with the world is a great thing to do because if you can avoid, um, if you can avoid or have, help other people avoid your mistakes, I think that's a good thing. Or not even the mistakes, uh, just some of the, the, the really bumpy parts of the road. <laughs> if you can show them how to avoid those ruts and those um, uh, potholes, because some of them are pretty big, I think it's a good thing. In my experience, what happens is we don't really manage to avoid things. It's more now that we've experienced it and we read it in the book, we go, ah, see? <laughs> okay. I would have helped. Yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah, it's, hindsight is 2020. So it is. <laughs> but you, you you get encouragement and, and hopefully you get inspired <laughs> to do better next time. <laughs> mm. But very rarely do we yeah. listen first time and say, oh yeah, yeah, we get it. We get it. <laughs> We're not gonna make that mistake. You kind of have to put your hand in the fire first and think, oh, actually this hurts. <laughs> oh, if we can, can keep people from burning themselves really badly. That's that right. <laughs> Reduce the blast radius. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I really like the idea of sharing information with the world, that whole intent, because it came out in the way that you actually wrote the books. It came out in which you um, asked for inputs from, from people like me as well. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, one of these things I submitted was <laughs> really well, black and white. <laughs> you really helped me nicely uh, along the way. That this is about sharing information. It's not about lambasting a certain <laughs> part of the testing community. So it was a, a really deep lesson for me about, um, about the, the agile mindset going forward. Now, um, <clears throat> on those three books, what were your favorite top three ideas um, from those books? Yeah, I think the first one, Agile Testing, um, it was a book about explaining to testers how they might fit into an Agile team. And it was really kind of setting the space for them. Uh, and we've had a lot of people say thank you for that because they truly didn't know. The second book, I think is much more about the, the sharing because Lisa and I, we recognize we, we don't know everything. God, you know, that's kind of a given, isn't it? Um, and we haven't had experience in every context. So what we did was we had a lot of experienced people share their experiences. How did they get through this? What did they do? And I think that that was a really important part of that second book, More Agile Testing, because it was giving different contexts. And the third one, um, quite proud of it because we self-published it, which was a brave thing for us to do. Um, but our, our, um, the first two books are really thick. They're 500 pages. We had lots to say. So we made a challenge for ourselves on the third book to keep it under 100 pages. And that was a really difficult thing to do. But the last chapter to me is my favorite because we had a lot of our instructors um, and, ide and people share ideas of what the role of a tester might look like in the future. And to me, um, all of these great ideas, it just shows that there is no one right way to do things. Mm. People can kind of choose which path they wanna go on, that there's a multiple choices out there. They don't have to do it by the book, whatever the book means, right? Um, and they get to choose. So I think that was my favorite chapter of the whole thing. Other people's work. <laughs> 
so okay. that's a that's a really important point um and i want to draw that uh, through to you you mentioned governance we talk about oversight and that's the act of overseeing and also oh we overseen something we forgot it um or it's an oversight so we we talk about oversight in, instead of governance in in this context mm -hmm. so um how do you think what you just shared with us is the sharing information and looking at um, how uh, how you can do things differently and being open to that. How does that extend into the world of oversight and, and governance? Well, I think that um, it's important to understand your context, and this will come up a lot as we talk. But we, so for example, in more agile testing, which is much more, is more, um, we go into deeper, we go, in, we have a chapter on testing in the enterprise, say recognizing that large organizations require more control. Mm. But how do we uh, balance, and, and I know that you use the word balance a lot as well, but how do you balance that? And one of the things that I see quite often is that it's the culture of the organization. How do they implement those controls? Mm -hmm. right? Is it the bottom, you know, from the top down and say, you know, um, this is how you're gonna do it? Because I think that's what causes say tension between different people, different parts of the organization. Um, I, I think, and in our, our chapter on large organizations, we talk about, um, that it's important that they have controls for consistency sake, mm -hmm. because you don't want every different delivery team using different tools. It just, it's not sustainable, right? Um, but I think over the years, um, organizations develop those different controls as the company grows. Um, they try to solve specific problems but they're reluctant. Um, they don't want to change um, because it's worked for them in the past and they're not wanting to see any difference, right? And, and I think I've worked really closely with some different governance folks. Um, and I think that if you work, you can adapt um, and, and see both sides of it, right? What, what can we adapt? We also have a, a chapter in the book about regulatory because testing regulatory stuff mm. is really important, right? So we try to give tips and tricks, but then um, again, we had those stories from practitioners that show how they solved specific problems. Um, and and um, we're lucky enough that there's quite a few people in, in, this, um, in this global space that have different knowledge to share. So you've that touched on, yeah, very much. And, and you've touched on quite a lot of things that are, we will either have battle scores of ourselves or that resonates quite strongly. The, the thing about context that you touched on um, is really important. Um, and a lot of the stuff that we do when we help uh, with, with solving these oversight challenges with, with organizations is to co-create that, is to um, mm -hmm. approach yes. it to look at where is the 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 the, the communal ground? Um, you you know that you you've seen the technique that we've used uh, using polarity mapping as an approach, but that's given us quite a lot of headway in order to work together um, and remove the us and them uh, biases uh, mm -hmm. out of the equation. Now I want to talk a little bit further about that because. We've seen um, many similar divides in the past. You know, many years ago, when I was in software testing, um, developers looked down at testers, as, and I was even accused of being a failed programmer at some stage, simply because I chose to graduate into testing from programming. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that was quite a slap in the face, but this is not the only um, tensions that we see in organizations um, or factionalism, let's call it that. So that traditional um, war between developers and testers, uh, Ruth Tennyson from Poltec said many years ago, the war is over. 
Um, I can still see his hands doing that. Um, <clears throat> but we see language and habits um, as part of this fac factionalism. It's, oh, they, the testers did this, or oh, the developers did this, mm -hmm. or oh, these governance people did this. or um, And it seems like a contagion that affects other communities. It's never just singular. There's, there's, a, there's a sort of a bleed into other aspects. So, and that means that we forget the customer. So what's your view on how we might overcome this discord and disconnection? It's, uh, so when the, the tester developer relationship, one of the things, I just, I just uh, finished a talk at a conference a couple of weeks ago, um, a developer that I work really closely with, we, we act, our talk was actually about um, our experience, how we started in a very bad relationship, but how we grew and how we learned to work with each other and, and now have developed this tremendous amount of trust. Um, but I think it's about um, being able to see other people's perspective, mm. right? Um, I, and I just finished watching uh, about two hours ago, a really interesting webinar just, it was a different premise. So they had two different people and they each chose um, a topic that they don't believe in, that they do not believe in. <laughs> so, so one of them, so, um, and you know me, you may know Fiona Charles, but her topic was, um, I think we should have a separate test organization. And so what she was doing was she was just presenting her case why we need a separate test organization versus embedded testers on teams. And what was interesting about it was she had to go back and look at why people think that. And she was using those kind of arguments. And at the end, they, they asked both of these people to say, so did it help change your mind at all by going back and, and saying, um, all the arguments that you don't believe. And, and both of them said what it did was it, it helped them to maybe think there were grains of truth in some of the things that were there before, but maybe we could, um, instead of throwing everything out, maybe there's something that we could pull in and change how we work and do it a little bit better, right? Um, so what if we started doing, like in our course, we have uh, the, the course that we that I teach, we have different people take different roles mm. on the on the team. And sometimes the biggest takeaway is, gee, I didn't know the product owner had such a hard role. I fell into the developer traps, just like that developer always does. What if we could do more of that? What if we could um maybe not do other people's jobs, but spend more time pairing, mm. learning from each other. Um, could we make that disconnect go away? Would it be kind of magical if we could just uh, open and, and see what the other person does rather than keeping them at arm's length and say, this is my job, that's your job and, and learn more about it? I don't know. Right. So because how do we get rid of our own biases? Mm. Um, Linda Rising did a talk, a keynote um, a while ago, and it was we make our decisions as human beings and there's scientific evidence and stuff. We make our decisions on our emotions mm. every time. What we do afterwards is we use our reasoning part of our brain to back up why we made that emotional decision <laughs> or justify it <laughs> yes we justify yeah. it yes and and so that said how can we how can we get those emotions to be helping us versus you know blocking us from actually looking and opening i don't know that's really a strong case um and and Again, I want to bring it back to the polarity mapping technique that we use um, that does exactly that. It brings the up and down sides of both perspectives. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it forces, not forces, but it creates an environment where people can look at both sides and then come up with how do we solve this together? That, right. that, that collective uh, view. I think you just hit the right word too. How do we solve it? Mm. Right. And I think that's important. And that puts pressure on people that used to, that, that traditionally had to have the answers. There's probably going to be quite a, <laughs> an urge to jump in and say, well, this is the answer. And if we say no, then again, there's a, new, a whole new tension starting. Right there. <laughs> exactly. Well, exactly. People have had this um, habit ingrained throughout their careers. You get promoted by being the person that knows what to do. Mm. And when we get to, we don't know what to do, and no one single individual knows what to do all by themselves, this is where we get to exactly what you were highlighting, Janet. We need to discover together what to do. (laughs) How do we engage with one another to do really well? And to a large extent, that's what we're proposing with this adaptive oversight concept in that rather than us and them, it's like we figure out a better way of executing and noticing Mm -hmm. what's most worthwhile together. What's that saying? saying? If you go alone, if if you go fast, you go alone. If you go far, you go together. That's that's sort of the saying. Yeah. 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 I believe, I truly believe that. And yet there's still a lot of people in this world that think they need to know all the answers. Mm. We have a book for them from Ryan Holiday. Um, (laughs) And I've been guilty of that too. Um, (laughs) Ego is the enemy is quite a a confronting book, but um, it's helped me through quite a lot of insights. So, yeah. Yes. And ego gets in the way a lot. Yeah, it does. Yeah. We all have that, that, uh, that particular bias to overcome yeah yeah for you now forgive me um i'm struggling with technology a little bit but that's fine uh so in <laughs> terms of um uh, we, we mentioned oversight, right? And we yeah. emphasize that um, it's um, it can be anything from boards of directors to senior executives in their various forums to I have a small project and it has an oversight committee of some sort, a steering group, a steering committee, yeah. and so on, right? So thinking in terms of influences and experience with uh, these uh, oversight uh, communities. Um, can you tell us of um, an instance where you were amazed by the the way it actually turned out? Uh, this was really fantastic. It was really great. Yeah. So one, one comes to mind. I have a few different ones, but I think the one that comes to mind is that um, it was, um, it was, uh, the organization was dealing with money transactions. So there was regulatory and all kinds of other things, but they had, um, and they were trying to put in, we were very much, the delivery teams were all agile, but they had put in this process. They were putting in ITIL. You might you mm. might've heard about that, sure, right? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you have. Anyhow, um, they were putting that in place for their customer service. So they had all kinds of SLAs in place and they had this whole process for reporting their customer bugs and how the service people, uh, when they could close the bugs, when they, all of these things, and they had this whole model, but they really didn't know what to do with the bugs that went to the software group, to the, to the delivery teams. Um, it didn't fit into their models. And they want they they came to um, to me at that point. I was a consultant, and so they they came to the the uh, director of QA, but also to me, um, and and said, uh, "So, can we make all of the development teams use this particular defect tracking system that we use?" 
And uh, we pretty much said, no, <laughs> it, it just, it wasn't going to work. I would, I knew, I know the system. And I said, there's no developer and no tester that wants to use that system. It is good for your customer bugs and doing your custom, mm -hmm. but it's not good for what we needed. Well, they kind of step back and, and put their, their, their uh, defensive hats on because they thought they'd solve the hat, the problem. And, and so I thought, Janet, okay, step back, get rid of that ego, get rid of that thing. What can we do to make this work? So we sat down and we, we figured out what, what they needed, talked about what we needed. And what they, we ended up doing was they created a little, um, I don't even remember what we called it, but a link from their system to our defect tracking system or our, where we were keeping defects. And so everyone that was determined to be a software bug, bug of the system, um, they would take and um, make the link into ours and then close theirs. Mm. It took me, I think, three weeks of having meetings to convince them why they could close that bug in their system because it is now being taken care of by something completely different. It's mm. the same as anything else. Um, but the result of all of that is they got a really smooth way of working with, um, of going, and it took very little work once we figured out who needed what and what they were really trying to do. They really didn't care about, all, all they cared about was how do we let the customer know when it's ready? Right. And, and so we solved those kinds of issues. We just solved them as in a different way that they hadn't anticipated. And to me, I, I, I learned a lot about kind of stepping back and, and trying to, what is the problem we are trying to solve mm. instead of, because our first meeting was a us versus them. Mm. Um, and we had to like tear that apart again. And it was really it was very um, effective in the long run, but it was hard. <laughs> One of the uh, um, lessons in your training um, I, I, um, that, that I've seen as well is, is that a question that is one of, on one of the slides is that when you have to deal with these situations is the first question is, is what is the problem you're trying to solve? Yes. And that always stuck with me um, mm -hmm from the learning that I've done with, with you. This is now many years ago, probably 10 <laughs> years ago. But that, 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 that sentence on the slide yep. is always uh, stuck with me. What's the problem you're trying to solve? Yep. And then you can go back to basics. Yes. Every time. Yes. Very good question. Yeah. Because otherwise, they were trying to solve something else mm. by making the developers use their system they weren't really trying to solve the problem. They were solving some, uh, some kind of symptom that they had, but yes. And this extends, that thinking extends into managers wanting reports for the sake of reports, et cetera, et cetera. So absolutely. Yeah. What problem are you trying to solve? Yep. Yeah. It, it stuck with me through the years. Thank you for that, Janet. Oh, you are so welcome. <laughs> Oria, you have a follow-up question. Yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, what you've just mentioned has uh, brought to mind for me, um, we encounter all sorts of frameworks in, in modern mm -hmm. business. Yeah? yeah, And I'm wondering, what's your experience with uh, the way in which frameworks either uh, support or hinder um, efforts to, to get better? Well, I think the framework as such um, it, it gets in the way when it forces you to follow, <clears throat> follow a specific process, right? So I'm um, a, a defect tracking system that I shall not name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the world seems to use. Um, <laughs> okay. This forced, takes me forced. to Bilbo and his... <laughs> struggles with the smile yeah, yeah. exactly but it force it forces you to use their language and their way of thinking <clears throat> and if your if your process is different then it's a mismatch and you're making people relearn words and relearn meetings um, 
any kind of a framework is that same problem. If it forces organizations to change the way they do business um, in a bad way, it's not helpful. So I like to tell people, figure out your process. What, it, what is it you do? Where do you want to be? What is kind of what's your goal? What are you trying to solve? And then pick a framework that helps you get there, right? Is it, can it adapt to your needs or is it plunking it down and saying, you know, this is what you must do. And so frameworks that help us, I think is an important thing, right? Um, if it's too onerous for people to do or teams to adapt or to adopt, I guess is the word I want, um, people will work around it. Mm. Uh, people are really good at working around things. And so any framework, you don't want that happening. You want them to use the benefits. Um, and so I think that when you have um, the checks and balances that make sense, that's what you want. Can, can I figure out my context and what's the best way to use this for us? But what I found in the past is that if there's too much of that, management doesn't like it because it makes them think. <laughs> and they don't necessarily want to think. My opinion. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fantastic. See, thinking is very energy intensive, isn't it? It is. It consumes a lot of, um, um, of glucose in the brain. And therefore, our default attitude is, don't make me think. Um, I don't want to think. I just want to uh, work on habit. And if I can get away with just working on habit, so much the better. Trouble is, the world isn't much inclined to, to go with. Humans can just operate on habit. If that were the case, we'd still be in caves, kind of clinking stones together. Um, <laughs> so, it's true. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> because things change and we want, we have a, a drive, a desire for, for the better, we need to cultivate uh, some discipline, some way of, of noticing. And that's kind of what makes a bit of a difference uh, between us and, and other creatures on earth is we can envisage a better future and we can sacrifice a little bit of the present comfort with the intention of um, investing in that better future. And I'm wondering, uh, what are your um, suggestions or experiences or recommendations as to establishing better discipline? So I think it's, I, I'm going to so make a difference between self-discipline mm. and uh, discipline enforced by others, right? So what we want in our teams, um, our knowledge workers, is self-discipline. Can they have guidelines? Um, I've heard some people call them um, um, guardrails. Mm that we operate in between or within. But the, the other parts that fitting there is our self-discipline of our team, right? And, and working together as a team um, and individuals, of course. But I would much rather promote that, really thinking about how can we do that than when I see or hear people say, how can we get better discipline? I keep having this um, image of somebody you know, taking a, I know you've got um, um, a willow switch is what we would have used in the olden days in Alberta, a willow switch across somebody's, you know, behind saying, work harder, work <laughs> a better. Cane. A cane, yes. A cane, yes. Yeah. yeah. You got the bamboo things behind you and that just threw <laughs> you right off. <laughs> yeah. But, but yes, right. Um, and that's the, when I say, think about how can we enforce discipline? That's what I think of. What I'd like to see is how can we get people to, to get self-discipline? Mm. And, and motivation is one of those really tricky things. We can't motivate people either. They have to be um, self-motivated. But what managers and, and leadership can do is provide that environment in which they can grow and uh, find their own motivation. Right. Mm. 
does intrinsic motivators. Yeah. I mm. think this is a beautiful insight um, about leadership cultivating an environment in which people can find their own uh, call to action, their own motivation, their own purpose. I think that's mm -hmm. beautiful. Now, if we all had that, it'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, that's the thing. Yeah, it's not so much that we have it. It's more we notice that we don't quite have it and we decide to do something about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and sometimes you can't get it in a particular um, yeah. place. So you have to leave, right? Th that's true. That's true. Sometimes um, we have to shift uh, location altogether. Uh, other times <laughs> we can apply... Um, when, <laughs> Look at us, for instance, both Aldo and myself, um, we're, we're far from the places of our birth, right? So. Right. Um, I, I know quite a few New Zealanders, and they're all from somewhere else. <laughs> Most of them, yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I see a lot the same in Canada, too. We've got lots from mm. everywhere else, right? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say the same for Canada. <laughs> yeah, there, there's, a, there's a few of us that are like, third and fourth generation but mm. um they're they're uh, not that many it seems so but that's okay yeah and it, and it goes the same within companies like that the one company i was talking about where i became the qa manager it was very toxic it was extremely mm. toxic not to me as a programmer but to me as a qa manager because their culture didn't really fit to accepting the idea of um, testers as equals, <clears throat> let alone the QA manager actually having input into things. It's just, it was a bad culture and it was toxic. But that was also a true and part of the industry in its infancy. Um, I worked in a few organizations that I experienced exactly that as the, mm -hmm. the the, the lead test, uh, testing person or the, the, the QA manager or the test manager, whatever we were called at those days. Mm -hmm. um, I've experienced that as well. Um, I think it comes from the basic uh, thing that nobody likes being told what they've done wrong. Um, and <laughs> it's, That's true. That's true. <laughs> testing. <laughs> But it, it, you, you start to develop and you start to learn how to handle those conversations. Um, the first year or two that, that you keep getting pushback, you got to start thinking, hang on a minute, I got to find a different way to approach this. And um, personally, I found a different way to go walking up to a, a six and a half foot programmer and say, your code is wrong. Um, you know, you, you may find, find <laughs> yeah. yourself stapled to the wall. Um, so there's a, a, there's a different way that I had to learn yeah. how to approach that. And I, I think that, that lessons extends into the agile coaching practice that I've done. Mm -hmm. Just walking in as a coach into an organization and say, oh, you're doing it all wrong. It's yeah. not going to win you any friends. And neither is the approach on how you, uh, neither would the approach to um, the oversight people uh, or the, uh, on, and it's a two-way street. Um, oh, absolutely. Accusing them of not, of not knowing where their um, backside is from their elbow um, is, is not going to win you any friends. And okay. also the other way around is accusing the team uh, doing the hard work and the hard graft, um, not, them not knowing what they're doing. Oh, that's that's just going to cause a bigger rift. Um, yeah. 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 I know that. So I said I had a couple of stories. The there was um, in one company that I was consulting in. Um, one of the struggles with the team was the security folks. They would come in at the end and they would test and then they'd make the team fix a bunch of stuff. And so. Um, I went in, I, when I was there, I went into the security folks and I said, I asked them what their biggest issue was with the delivery teams. And they pretty much said, well, they're idiots. They never think of security. They're just, they're not, they're just, yeah, well, they had lots of good words. I won't repeat, but anyhow. <laughs> so by the time I left, um, they were actually talking to each other. The security <laughs> folks, it, it was, you know, it was okay. okay. Um, the security folks, because I made a couple of really um, 
small recommendations and, and ideas, planted a few seeds. Um, but this, by the time I left, the security folks were designing a course to give to the programmers to, so that they could start programming with security in mind, mm. right? Um, and some of the security folks were starting to attend the planning meetings so that they could talk about the risks and other things, right? And they were spending time with the testers to teach them how to look for vulnerabilities. And so that approach, how do you approach it um, is a huge, a huge thing, right? I kind of come in with, with no expectations, but just starting to do some seeds and, and then it grew and um, I'm sure they would have bumps along the way, but mm -hmm. you know, even like the security folks I know were still tested after, but I can imagine the improvement in their approach. That story has triggered a thought now um, with me is I'm increasingly getting the, um, what do you call it? I'm, I'm increasingly getting certain that oversight and governance is not about oversight and governance. It's about people. Um, yeah. I'm getting more and more the idea that it's more about the people than it is about anything else. Um, we we work with people at the end of the day. Um, the software is just uh, or or whatever it is that we work with. Um, the products, yeah, yeah. But it's actually the people that build it. Thank you. That was a, a big insight. Again, keeping <laughs> uh, I'm keep, keep getting that that recurring theme here. Oreo. Yeah. So. Um... I loved very much uh, the way you've um, described the initial enmity with the security team. And uh, not only that, but the fairly natural frustration uh, that the uh, security people were expressing. And they were demonstrating that frustration by using fairly sharp language, shall we call it. Yeah. So um, in our uh, research, um, we call these things triggers. Um, we, we can notice um, indicators mm -hmm. that tell us, aha, something is amiss. Uh, mm, you know, yeah. very much like uh, something being rotten in Denmark kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, your your countermeasure for this was to was to gently nudge the environment such that the people consider uh, a reframing and a reimagining of the collaboration. Right? Mm -hmm. um, we find, um, for instance, habits like uh, uh, a no they day. In other words, uh, what if for a day we make the word they um, a swear word and we have a swear jar? Right. So in other words, we don't um, <laughs> uh, refer to anybody in our organization as a they. Right? Well, well, it's it's us, not uh, they are doing this to us. They are idiots. They are not uh, paying yeah. attention to us and so on. So there's not an us and them because ultimately we're all in the same boat, mm -hmm. uh, as the Kiwis put it, in the same waka. Yeah. Same, same waka. canoe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So. Um, <laughs> Ultimately, if I do really well and you do poorly and we're in the same organization, that's not helping anybody. Because ultimately, help anybody. exactly, our customers yep. are the ones that suffer. So us being very uh, sort of um, upset and, and nicely entitled uh, to our uh, fury to say, how dare they ruin it for us? Yeah, you know, it's like, no, no, oh, no, yes. no, no. <laughs> it's not they, and they're not having anything against us. <laughs> it's just, yeah. we haven't figured it out together. It's, it's a failure of our ingenuity as to how mm -hmm. to do this better, uh, together. So I yeah. think that was, that was actually, uh, phenomenal. And, um, what it brings to mind is this possibility of, keeping an eye on the flow of value to the customer. Because mm. if we remind ourselves of why, why are we doing this? I'm not just here to make my silo shine, right? My department right. is fantastic. It's like, yeah, you may have a beautiful, shiny department, but if it's surrounded yeah. by shacks, nothing good comes of it. Right? Yeah. So 
how do we help each yeah. other out, right? Yeah. So um, um, you've, you've given a, a magnificent example there. Um, now, what I will ask, maybe a little bit uh, challenging, possibly even controversial, is um, what are your suggestions or recommendations on how might we inspire other senior leaders and executives to practice a bit more of this um, empathy and, and humility to notice that perhaps it's better if we focus beyond our just small silo and maybe we should care about the other colleagues as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we get stuck in our little silos um, for sure. But I, I talk a lot about whole team and I usually mean the delivery team. Um, but I also talk about the idea of an extended family, right? Um, because they all have influence on us um, and we need to consider the, the, you know, the governance and security. It's all part of those extended families. I tell people to think about their mother-in-law. They, they can't just ignore her. She's part of um, her extended family. How do you get along with her? How do you mitigate those risks? How do you, right? And sometimes it's harder than others, right? But I think when we start making it visible, when you talk about that whole flow, I'm a fan of visibility. So let's put that flow, and I've done this in multiple teams, let's put that flow from front, from the very beginning to what happens at, you know, wherever you consider end. And end is not even at the end. It's I use an infinity diagram or mm. infinity loop these days because that comes back and you start learning. But how does it all fit? Where are the things and, and how does it fit together? Because you're right, if we fix our team, and it doesn't matter how good we develop something, it doesn't matter how good our programmers are, our testers, even our product owner, if we optimize that chunk, but we failed to think about the security, or we failed to think about uh, some other piece, it's not going to get out any faster. It's mm -hmm. just going to come back to you. Mm -hmm. So. I think once you put things and make it visible, then you can start looking at those dependencies. Um, and then we can start having those conversations. Mm. You know, where do the hooks have to be? When do we have to start thinking about this? What can we do to help you? What can you do to help me, right? Um, because everybody wants to know what's in it for them. It's just mm. human nature as well. But what we want to think about is how can we do and make things go with probably the least amount of disruption in what we do every day. And so until we make it visible and know we have to do things, um, it's really hard to have those conversations. Mm. It's really hard. So, and, and it goes for, for management and everybody else. Where yeah. do they fit in? Because they do fit in. They do. Every time they ask for one of those silly reports, which we don't want to do, it disrupts. Yeah. One of the tools that we've come across over the last two years was the stuff that Al Shallow has done with BMI, and that's to build the mm. idealized value stream. Yes. And yeah. you actually put that in front of the audience and you actually go, uh, you explain the basics of it and then you start asking questions. What are we experiencing yeah. here? What are the struggle patterns? And he, he's, he's, um, he's, he's built the model in such a way that <clears throat> there's common struggle patterns that people can, that you can put in front of people and go, that's exactly what we're struggling with. And mm -hmm. then he says, well, here's a few ways in which you can fix that. And he borrows heavily from lean, lean practices, uh, as well as some of the agile things. Yeah. And, and that's visualizing it. And you get yes. a lot more meaningful conversations out of that experience than um, just talking up a cloud and then the moment the door opens, it all evaporates. Yep. So, um, yeah. Well, I'm, I know one of the things that I do when I go into a company and do some consulting, if I'm doing some kind of maybe um, a quality practice retro, um, assessment or something, mm. the first thing I will do is do a process retrospective, mm. which is 
what is our timeline? When you first get an idea, what happens to it? Uh, when does it come into the delivery team? Who do you talk to? What happens? What does it do once it's out of the delivery team? Do you have any access to it? And we walk through that whole thing, but asking questions. And, and then every time I hear, because you got to listen for those problems because they don't just pop up, mm -mm. right? You, oh, that says to me that. And I'll put up a, a pink sticky or something on the board to say, here might be a problem area. And we can talk about that after. So it's very much you know, kind of a value stream without any of the um, framework stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, a, it's, you know, but making it visible. And people often don't even realize the things that they are doing mm. that happen every week, every, you know, all the time, they don't understand. They've never thought about it that way. We're waiting for this. Oh, somebody has to do this. Mm. Right. Oh, third party. What are you doing? Yeah. In that same way, um, uh, governance and oversight exist for a reason. It has value. Um, yeah. And by making that visible, um, you can actually get quite a lot of the um, us and them animosity out the way because people start to see the value that it's supposed to bring. And then you can work together on how do you um, accelerate that value as well. You keep using this word value, uh, Aldo. And uh, <laughs> the, the challenge there is what if, I'm playing kind of devil's advocate here. Yes. Um, I, I look at these again, they, the idiots, you know, that are asking us for those silly reports that Janet was talking about. So therefore, what value, right? I, I don't see the value in that. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to, to ask Janet, uh, what are your thoughts on how might we develop a better definition of what value actually means, right? So we have a better grasp of, of value. Yeah. So I think that word is very much like the word quality. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been a whole philosophical discussion for many, many years. Let's I, be I, controversial. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> right. And so value, uh, you know, I've heard people measure it by, um, and every time I'm terrible at um, three letter acronyms. I just, I never remember them. They just don't stick. Um, it's like mnemonics. They don't work for mm -hmm. me either. Um, so every time I hear N NPV, net present value, net present, whatever. Yeah. NPV, um, and yeah. they say that, yeah, they measure it by that. And I go, okay, that means nothing to me. I don't know what that means. So value, so quality. So the one the one definition of quality that people say, or not, they use the most, shouldn't say they say, but is Jerry Weinberg's, which is, it has value to some person. Mm -hmm. And there's that value word, right? So it has value to some person, but there might be 15 different stakeholders you should need to think about. So it's not a good enough, to me, it's not a good enough um, uh, definition. I, I don't think that the word value, the word quality can ever be defined in one sentence or two sentences. Because value is, and I've done a couple of, I've done a couple of talks on these particular things. Uh, so, <laughs> so value might depend on the price, right? I use coffee. So I got tea right now. But if I'm having a, a cup of black coffee from the garage and I pay 50 cents for it or a dollar. Um, how do I compare that to a $5 coffee at Starbucks? What, what is the value? What is the level of quality? Perhaps they use exactly the same bean, a coffee bean. And really they probably taste exactly the same but I'm paying a dollar at a gas station and $5 at Starbucks. Is there a value difference? Are people getting more out of the Starbucks that they're willing to pay for that? 
Is it a higher level of quality? You know, and so when you start talking about value and you start talking about quality, there's so many more dimensions. I think you have to just expand. Yeah, well, one of the greatest challenges with value is it, for some people, you can almost hear when they say the word value, you, you hear ka-ching, 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 it's money, yeah. <laughs> right? And um, yes. this, this mental habit, because you were talking about NPV, right? And you think, what the heck, MPV? Yeah, but the thing is, MPV, as soon as you say MPV, that has deliberately a financial bent to it, and that's it. it. Yep. Right? So, what if you're talking about a social uh, service context? Exactly. How do you quantify that? Right? Yeah. Less people going hungry, less people potentially getting ill or, or even dying, mm -hmm. right? For yep. lack of this or that, or, you know, um, uh, safer um, roadways and bridges and, uh, and, and so on. How do you get your NPV for that? Well, hold on a second. <laughs> if you want to yeah. quantify everything in terms of money, whoa, whoa. It doesn't whoa, always whoa. go. Exactly. <laughs> it doesn't it always doesn't. fit. Yeah. No. So no. Um, value needs more of a conversation. Now, the thing is, this gets us then into uh, who has the power? <laughs> yes. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Because ultimately, uh, power in this context says, uh, I will decide what's important and we will focus on this and we will call this valuable. And if you're not included in that conversation, your perspective of value is not heard, there. not paid attention to, and therefore safely ignored. Now, one of the things that I think we're, we're starting to do a little bit better as humanity is developing better ways of hearing more voices. But that brings with it all sorts of trouble as well. Because when you hear yep. all of the voices, you end up with Twitter. <laughs> yeah. uh, and some so rich was... guy buys it yeah <laughs> oh we won't even go into the voices in... i live i know yeah don't i'm not, not going to get political here uh, <laughs> that was not but, my intention <laughs> no i know i know i know I, my head just went somewhere uh, <laughs> it's okay yeah but there are different voices and i think when we come back to um Visibility. So I'm a fan of Goiko Adzik's uh, impact mapping, mm. yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you start to talk about what is the goal, but who are the people, who are the stakeholders, and what is the impact that they're having? And it forces people to think about what impact do they have on them and what impact does whatever we want to do. Right? It makes you think about those different customers. Some are internal, some are external. Um, some might be actual end users, but you also might have um, stakeholders within a company, your governance committee, for example, mm. right? Um, it, there's so many different kinds of, of um, and I'm gonna use this word stakeholders because it encompasses. Um, quite often I just use customers, but then people get confused. They think just end user. And that's not what I ever mean, but yes. <clears throat> Yeah, what comes to mind is Horia when you were when you were explaining is it's known as the golden rule. He who brings the gold makes the rules. Um, <laughs> so. It's true. It's true. My my husband said that to my daughters every day of their life. Oh. <laughs> he made them have they he made them memorize three rules. Yeah. One was the man of the gold makes the rules. Uh, the second one was life isn't fair. And the third one was, because everybody needs some trivia, is the definition of pH. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Which is, you know, the negative log of the hydrogen ion, which makes no sense. But ah, acidity, um, yeah. But yeah, but it just, it, uh, it just said, um, you know, uh, it was to stop conversation. Right. So one of That's why he said it. And it does. <laughs> that was my it point. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, that's the thing. I'm not sure that um, humans can actually thrive um, in in the absence of good dialogue. 
Yeah. Um, because ultimately, uh, this idea of life isn't fair. Well, it's an interesting observation that life isn't fair. And it's true. I mean, uh, what does the uh, galaxy care that I've stubbed my toe? It's unfair. Yeah, everybody should care that I'm in pain, but nobody cares. <laughs> or if they do, they don't show it. <laughs> but um, ultimately, I find this fascinating. Humans seem to have evolved for empathy for 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 caring for one another because for we're not for, talking about a specific cut no no one sorry no i'll just i'll stop I'll tell stop. me more no no tell me more i know i just um there's been a, a bill overturned in the last little while right and right, 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 right. and yeah. so the, the whole yeah. caring thing isn't always there yeah well see what i was where i was coming uh with that was Throughout the course of history, humans have lived in tiny um, communities most of the mm -hmm. time, right? So this idea of living in millions upon millions, um, that has been only very recent, yeah? So true, true. most of the time, we were in a small village where everybody knew everybody else, um, mm -hmm. and we really cared for one another because if um, the second removed cousin kind of dies of thirst or hunger or uh, cold, yep. it's, a, it's not a good look on anybody right so we we want to care for one another we we most of the time have evolved for caring now think about the population of psychopaths yeah it, they're not in, non-existent <laughs> but it's very tiny yeah unfortunately in the grand scheme yeah exactly unfortunately what do we do we go about uh, saying aha uh, we must make the numbers and who are the people that make the numbers? Well, the psychopaths tend to make more of the numbers because they don't care how much hurt and pain others suffer when you make the numbers and you kind of force things. So therefore they get promoted and we get a larger proportion of people with psychopathic tendencies in positions of authority, right? That's interesting. Which then leads to this kind of, um, uh, shall we say, chronic um, in-group, out-group uh, division, which we've witnessed, uh, as you were saying, with the uh, overturning mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the ruling, right? Because we essentially double down of this is my camp, that's your camp. It's like we've forgotten yeah. about the fact that, hold on a second, we're all humans. We, we're all yeah. in this together. We're all in the same waka. And, and yeah. this is not going to go well if, if we forget how to, to be in dialogue with, uh, with yeah, one another. With and by other. the way, <laughs> people with two X chromosomes, they should be in charge of their bodies, <laughs> period. <laughs> no, <laughs> no doubt about no it. Questions. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Well, everybody but, should be, so, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> Unless it hurts somebody else. Well, and, and even then you have to, you have to consider, yeah. hold on a second, what, yeah. what are we doing here, right? And what's good and, and what's better? And how do we, yes. how do we agree on, on that together? Mm. Yeah? yeah. And how do yeah. we learn to redeem each other? Because that's what we've forgotten. We seem to have forgotten that it doesn't matter what you've done yesterday. It matters where do you go from do you today? Do? Yes. Will you yeah. forgive the person that has hurt or harmed you? Or yeah. will you insist on justice, on vengeance? Yeah. yeah. Do we want to cultivate a humanity of vengeance, you know, John Wick style? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> right? well you killed my no. dog so i'm gonna kill everybody it's like yeah, hold on yeah. <laughs> yeah. no and and that's the thing even within teams right mm. um if you don't get over that if you can't learn to work with people doesn't mean they have to be your best friend yeah but you have to learn to work with people there and, we go. and solve those the problems what what problem are we trying to solve mm. yeah 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 is essentially when we were talking about uh, value, this, this kind of comes to the surface uh, all the time. How do we develop in conversation, in dialogue, a better understanding of what it means for, for more of us rather than just yeah. a few getting most of the benefit and uh, the many kind of bearing yeah. most, most of the burden? And, and <laughs> okay. I think you have to um, also define then when you're thinking about value for whom, mm. um, who is the majority? There's always going to, that life isn't fair thing. You cannot do it for everyone. Everyone mm. cannot possibly get every benefit from whatever it is. Um, so you're going to hurt a few people, but make it a conscious decision versus uh, ignoring them. 
And not only that, but I think uh, we need better imagination uh, because uh, th yes. there's there's <laughs> something as a zero sum perception, right? The zero sum perception mm -hmm. is that if we're sharing a pizza, then hey, if I have um, three quarters of the slices, I have the bulk of it, and there's only one quarter of the slices left for you, right? Fortunately, in life, we're not playing a finite game wherein there's only one pizza. Mm. We're playing actually an infinite game in which there's a potentially endless successions of pizzas and how we share these pizzas can change from time to time. So it doesn't have mm -hmm. to be that I go hungry all the time uh, and, and, and you stuff uh, yourself uh, more yes. and more. Yeah. Yep. So how do we make it so we learn about synergy, about one plus one yeah. makes more? Yeah, because it doesn't have to be just arithmetic. It has no. to be, you know what, we're actually getting more out of this together. And that's the definition of what a great yeah. negotiation is all about. It's not a compromise. It's actually yeah. a synergy. It's a way of sharing the win-win as opposed to both of us feeling kind of unfairly yeah. treated by yeah. the other party. Yeah. Now that's, that's kind of the worst outcome actually. <laughs> <laughs> because every, then you just go along with your humdrum. Uh, I don't really have a lot of energy in this. I don't have a lot mm. of anything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it sounds like you guys are also talking about the big resignation. Um, ah, <laughs> 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 oh, we got off to a whole new yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. So beyond zero sum sounds like a like a great uh, great topic to to wrap up on. Um, it's the ingenuity that I'm that I'm hopeful for for humans because uh, yeah. humans make stuff, humans imagine stuff, humans invent stuff. So um, I'll finish by asking you, Janet, uh, what are your hopes for us? Um, what are you hoping that we we invent that we imagine for for a better tomorrow? Ah, uh, ah, uh, well. I think, and I don't know if you can invent this, but I would like to see. Um, so the, the other day I had two things happen to me. One thing that was really um, uh, brought me down immensely. Um, somebody had a conversation and, and that, that wasn't very nice, but then somebody else in a different conversation um, put out and said, Janet, you're kind and considerate. Thank you for your time. And being able to get that one allowed me to push the other not so nice conversation out of the way. And I think that if we, if we actually talk to each other and realize that we're not enemies and we don't have to tear down other mm -hmm. people to make ourselves better it's not about tearing down those people right it's about building everybody up i think that that would be a magical thing right um being able to be safe being able to have courage um i was reading something the other day and it come up in a conference that somebody said if you feel safe you shouldn't need courage. And then I was, we <laughs> no. Were, yeah, no, but because there's so <laughs> many other kinds of courage, um, yeah. right? Besides the blame, there's lots of other kinds of courage as well. But how can we lift people up so that they are courageous and willing to share those ingenious ideas? That's what we want to do because there's yeah. a whole lot of people that don't. Yeah, yeah. No, but th th this perspective on, on safety is, is completely flawed. Um, because um, you have, for instance, situations of conflict, right? And oh, yeah. you're with your platoon, you're never going to be safe because bullets are flying all over the place. You're not going to be safe. You will always require courage to actually get out from behind that barricade and, and put yourself in harm's way. Humans will always have to practice courage despite fear. You, the world is, is an unsafe place anyway. I mean, think about it. None of us get out of it alive, right? Something gets us <laughs> in the end. It's, it's, it's unsafe yeah. from the moment of birth, right? Breathing is. Is, is hazardous to health, right? If you keep breathing, you're going to die. Sooner or later. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, 
but I think we need to be able to lift people up. So if you could invent some butt thing that yeah. was, you know, how can we do that? How can yeah. we allow people to show their courage? Enable yeah. people, not allow, yeah. enable. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Well, um, I think that's that's up to each and every one of us, um, frankly. And I'm, I'm much... Um, impressed uh, by your your kindness by your generosity uh, by your 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 insight and your support uh for this work thank you so much uh janet oh um good luck with everything you do because i think it's it's important work it has to be there mm. it's thank just you. a matter of yeah so thank you janet. all right and really it was of... it was great to actually have one of my mentors uh participate in in the focus um i always look up to you janet for uh all the the help you've given me over the years <laughs> especially when i was down <laughs> with uh having to deal with uh, the the uh, the forces in 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 organizations i remember uh, as a closing thought um janet uh, um told me once that um this is a typical pattern is that organizations always want the benefits that agile pro provides but they never prepare to do the hard work mm -hmm. that was quite profound for me as well so yeah and it is a lot of hard work yeah it is uh, yeah it's been such a great pleasure janet thank you for uh, for joining us today i'm aldu i'm horia and thank you again janet you are so welcome, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.